Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, dear representatives of Chesta Founders, Ambassador Alexandre Fassel, Swiss Special Representative for Science Diplomacy, who is representing uh, today the Swiss President and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Ignacio Cassis, Swiss State Secretary for Education, Research and Innovation, Martina Hirayama, State Councillor of the Canton of Geneva, Nathalie Fontanet, the Mayor of the City of Geneva, Marie Barbet Chapuis, dear representatives of the United Nations, Mr. Amandeep Singh Jill, Secretary General and Envoy for Technology, dear President de la Fondation pour Genève, Marc Pictet, representatives of the academic and diplomatic world, and all just guests who are here in Geneva and online throughout the world. I also would like to give a special welcome to our board members, to the chairs of the different forum, and to our team. On behalf of the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, I am pleased to welcome all to the opening of the second Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit. Three years ago, the founders of our organization, which are the Swiss government and authorities of the city of Geneva, trusted us with one mission, and that was to develop an instrument of anticipation and action in the service of humanity to widen the circle of beneficiaries of advances in science and technology. And on the other hand, and that's also very important, especially for Geneva, to strengthen Geneva as a leading hub for multilateralism. This mission we have transformed in three years into a recognized institution well suited to achieve its objectives and its purpose. But we also realize that we have no time to waste if we want to deliver the objectives which have been laid out in front of us. Geopolitical conflicts abound around the world, and at the same time, millions of people in the Horn of Africa are on the edge of famine. Food and fertilizers are in critical supply. Energy is not sufficient and prices are soaring. The planet is overheating and the most vulnerable suffer the most. Many people think that progress toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals is in serious doubts now. So the international community at the same time seems to be gridlocked by all these global crises. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, how can advances in science and technology help? What can science diplomacy do? How can we best serve the world? As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, these crises threaten the very future of humanity and the fate of our planet. But he also pointed out no major global challenge can be solved by a coalition of the willing alone. We need a coalition of the world. So let's get to work together. What have we as Chester done in the last three years? We acted as an honest broker in full transparency. First, our scientific forum had to access, had to scout and discover what is going on in the laboratories of this world. Second, our diplomatic forum had to better understand all the political and social implications of those breakthroughs. And in accordance with our mission, 
we have established several complementary instruments. For carrying out this work, we have started with an anticipatory instrument, which is a Chesta Science Breakthrough Radar. It offers an open source overview of scientific disruption in the making over the next quarter century. Along with this, we established an instrument for action. And this is the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit, which brings together this year more than 1,000 uh, participants and speakers from more than 44 countries. Thank you all for your huge interest in participating in this second 2022 edition and being with us today, whether it's physically here or whether it is uh, on screen. At this summit, we will have a preliminary assessment by political authorities, which will happen on Friday morning. And this is exactly why CHESTA was created uh, for multilateral science diplomacy. New this year, we have CHESTA's pipeline of solutions, which is also a new product which we are presenting. And if they are today for ideas, we hope that after the summit, they will become our working orientation, what we are going to do and work before. The first prototypes of possible actions to accelerate the use of emerging trends, such as quantum computing for sustainable development, or neurotechnology, or decarbonization, or the subject of science and diplomacy. We already have four big ideas for solutions in the works. And thanks to the work that began with our first RADA and Summit last year. The first two of them, the creation of an open quantum institute for the co-development of quantum computing applications and the development of a curriculum on global science and diplomacy for the next generation, both projects are well underway. During these three days, we will examine some of the most promising scientific disruptions presented in this radar. It should make all of us proud to do this work, to help bring forward solutions, initiatives, and projects that should benefit everyone. And as we do this, we also contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For a sustainable future, we must maximize benefits and minimize the risks. And fulfilling the potential, we have here in Geneva, drawing on resources we have here in Switzerland. Together, we can bring hope, bridge worlds, and support multilateralism, and find a path out of these dark times to hopefully a brighter future. And ladies and gentlemen, it is your critical input that will be extremely important. It will be channeled into a third breakthrough radar for next year and the third summit in 2023. So as we begin these three days of conferences, let me repeat, we have no time to waste. The world is filled with deepening challenges, divides and inequalities. It urgently needs our research. It urgently needs our passion. It urgently needs our care. It needs all of us. And most of all, it needs our solutions. With this in mind, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Geneva. Welcome to our second Geneva Science Diplomacy Anticipation Summit. And as we have the saying at Gesta, let's all together use the future to build a better present. Thank you very much. I have uh, now the pleasure to introduce our moderator, Muriel Siki, uh, who is a very recognized journalist. And your, the stage is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 JESDA Summit. My name is Muriel Siki, and I will be your moderator today. Last year, during the inaugural summit, COVID was a strong disruptive factor. Today, we are also facing major disruptive challenges, and for the next three days, we will talk about solutions, about what science and diplomacy can bring to the future to help us all face these challenges. JESDA is not just a think tank, it is also a do tank. Throughout the summit, we will present the new products developed by JESDA during the past 12 months, notably two very concrete solution ideas based on the 2021 JESDA scientific breakthrough radar and the work of the anticipatory situation room. Today, we launch the renewed version of the JESDA radar, which, as you know, is a rolling report initiating consultation with the global community. To guide us through these solutions, the organizers of the summit have gathered prestigious speakers and guests to enlighten us through debates and through speeches with different presentations and debates that you will all be able to follow. To start, I am very honored to present Ambassador Amandeep Singh Gill, a scientist and a diplomat who understands the policy choices and trade-offs of these two worlds. He is currently the United Nations Undersecretary General and Tech Envoy. So please welcome Amandeep Singh Gill, representing UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. President of the JESTA Board, Ambassador Fasel, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to attend the second JESTA Summit. It's also a pleasure to be back in Geneva and see so many friends and colleagues in the room. Distinguished participants, this is a time of bewildering change. Geopolitics is back with a vengeance. Rapid developments in science and technology are having a profound impact on our societies and our economies. Policymakers run the risk of being reduced to bystanders. We need to anticipate and to act with wisdom and discrimination. This is where, within a short period of time, JESTA has built a niche for itself. It has honed its focus through extensive consultations and brought practitioners from academia, diplomacy, finance, and civil society together on innovative platforms. JESTA's choice of quantum computing and advanced AI eco-regeneration and geoengineering, human augmentation, and science and diplomacy as its initial areas of focus reflects an astute assessment of policy dilemmas today. And the JESTA radar is an impressive tool to help policymakers stay abreast of cutting-edge scientific and technological developments. The solutions that are being presented today will add to this repertoire of tools. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, last month, the United Nations General Assembly decided to hold the Summit of the Future in September 2024. This will be an unprecedented opportunity to reboot multilateralism and renew international resolve to address the challenges we face now in which you, Mr. President, outlined so well, now and into the future. The Global Digital Compact, nourished by multi-stakeholder consultations and proposed for adoption at the summit, will be one of the critical outcomes. I invite all of you and the institutions you represent to visit our website and consider making a contribution to shape this outcome. 
There are two other issues that I wish to address today, and these are power and history. Why should scientists and technologists think about power? Isn't that for politicians and policymakers? Alas, we have known since the dawn of the atomic age that we cannot do this in silos. Power has many faces, some less obvious than others. There is power over in form of domination and guiding others, and there is power to, to take decisions and solve problems. There is power with, to come together for common purpose and defend group interest. And then there is power within, our identity, our self-esteem, and the ability to influence our own lives. Science and technology have a bearing on all of them. Even benign formulations such as problem owners and solution owners, sometimes heard even in this town, betray these asymmetries of power. As we pick problems and devise solutions, we need to reflect about power differentials. Who's making the choice and for whom? Who has less choices and is therefore more vulnerable to abuse and exploitation? These are critical reflections, not unfamiliar from previous generations of scientific developments and not boxes to be ticked as we develop powerful technologies and policies around them. This brings me to my second point, history. It's striking how a historical current approaches to science and technology can be, as if the past did not exist and those who lived earlier were not as smart as we are today. Listen to this quote from a 2018 interview with a computer scientist of a certain notoriety. Quote, the only thing that matters is the future. I don't even know why we study history. It is entertaining, I guess. The dinosaurs, the Neanderthals, and the Industrial Revolution, and stuff like that. But, but what already happened doesn't really matter. You don't need to know that history to build on what they made. In technology, all that matters is tomorrow. Really? There is a line we can draw through Friar Roger Bacon's brazen head to C-3PO in Star Wars and to IBM Watson. It is part magical thinking and part science. And it's very important to know which is which. History matters and ontology matters. Science is, after all, a human paradigm. It does not sit outside of the space-time continuum. As we gather in this city with its great humanist tradition, let us remember the nature of power, the importance of context, and the lesson of the past, even as we use the future to build the present. I thank you for your kind attention, and on behalf of the UN Secretary General, I wish you all success at the summit. Thank you, Ambassador. The president of the Swiss Confederation, Ignacio Cassis, unfortunately could not be with us today, but he did send us a welcome message, and we will hear it now. Mr. President of uh, Gesda Foundation, Lieber Peter Brabeck, uh, State Councillor of the Republican Canton of Geneva, Cher uh, Madame Nathalie Fontanet, Mayor of the City of Geneva, Cher Madame uh, Marie Barbet Chapuis, Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, Cher Madame Tatiana Valovaya, United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, Professor Armadip Singh Gill, Dear members of the Gesda Board of Directors, Your Excellencies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of my government, the Swiss Federal Council, to the second Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit here 
at the Campus Biotech in Geneva. Last year, I was pleased to present to you the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, known as GESDA, as a Swiss initiative operating in Geneva for the benefit of all the actors of global governance in Geneva and beyond, thus making the universal ambition of our endeavor very clear. That is, to anticipate scientific advancement and harness its benefits for them to be shared by everyone around the world. It was in this spirit that I invited you all to embark together on the journey of anticipatory science diplomacy. Today, I know that we have already covered considerable ground and I'm happy to report that the federal and cantonal authorities, having evaluated the progress made by GESDA in its pilot phase, have decided to extend its lifespan and give it a 10-year perspective running until September 2032. Moreover, the Federal Council has decided to triple the Federal contribution to GESTA. A good news. We have based our decision first on the quality of GESTA's early products, such as the Science Breakthrough Radar and last year's summit. Secondly, on the promise of the rich conversations GESDA has conducted with many of you around concrete ideas and initiative on how scientific breakthroughs and technological evolutions can be best captured for the benefit of humankind, notably the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, third, on the early success of GESDA as a public-private partnership as the founders have intended it to be, engaging with business and philanthropy, diplomacy and policymakers, as well as the many manifestations of civil society. With this second summit, GESDA is now scaling up its efforts, and I appeal to all the communities here to do the same. The challenge and the ambition are clear. What we are attempting to do here and what the United Nations Secretary General sets out in his report, our common agenda for the international community to do, is very much convergent and geared towards the same objective. How can we invigorate multilateral governance in the light of the urgency and acceleration of the global challenges and against the background of a geopolitical reality that risks driving us apart. Scientific advancement and the benefits that are to be drawn from it are key. Let us together capture, frame and share them in an inclusive and equitable manner. Starting now. Thank you. The Swiss and Geneva governments created the GESDA Foundations in 2019, as you've heard, as a new tool to help the world cope with all of the breakthrough science and technological advances, which will reshape how we see ourselves as humans, how we will relate to one another, and how we will care for the environment. From the onset, support from the Swiss and Genevese authorities have been absolutely essential. We are very happy to have with us today Nathalie Fontanet, State Councillor of the Republic and Canton of Genève. As the formal greetings have already been given, I would like to greet you all, ladies and gentlemen, briefly in your titles and functions. I'm very happy to be with you uh, today for the second GESTA annual summit. This magnificent uh, event is an opportunity for me to recall some of the fundamentals concerning International Geneva. When we look at our canton, we are contemplating nearly 160 years of experience in international cooperation. 
The first Geneva Convention dates back to 1864. The ecosystem that has since then been developed on our territory with more than 600 stakeholders is truly unique and uh, contains an immense potential for synergies. However, we will also have noticed that multilateralism is currently in bad shape. The impetus that emerged after the two world wars is no longer the same. Today, the world is more fragmented. The tendency is to turn inward. Moreover, the role of the international institutions created after 1945 is being questioned. Their effectiveness, too. The existing institutions must adapt or even reinvent themselves. The paradox is that in increasingly independent world, international Geneva is more necessary than ever. Migration, climate, trade, pandemics, the internet, taxation, and equality are issues that cannot be dealt with by one country alone, however powerful it may be. International cooperation is not an option, it is part of the solution. Adapting and strengthening global governance is a complex task. In the current context, we need safe spaces for dialogue and cooperation, and Geneva wishes to continue to play this role. But we also need to integrate the voice of science into global governance, and the work of the Jester Foundation is of critical importance. Being a locally elected politician, I know how difficult it is to take into consideration long-term anticipation in every day's political decision-making. We need help to understand the future challenges, their impact, and how we can address them. This is what JESTA is about. This year's summit will not only bring anticipation, but also fo focus on the development of solutions in evaluating the first prototypes of possible avenues of actions to accelerate the use of some of those emerging trends such as quantum computing for sustainable development, neurotechnology, decarbonization, and science diplomacy. Just the vocation is to catalyze these solution projects that could be politically endorsed and furthered at global diplomatic level. As co-founder, the State of Geneva is particularly proud to support this solution-oriented mission. With the expertise of the ecosystem, Geneva can be seen as a laboratory for developing and testing solutions to solve global issues. The State Council, which I represent today, intends to pursue the support to International Geneva as whole, well, willing to strengthen it with the innovative and effective approach brought by Justice Foundation in anticipating global issues and finding solutions to the universal challenges that surround us. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all a very successful summit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam State Councillor. Another major supporter of JESDA is the Fondation pour Genève. It was a major actor in the development of JESDA's scientific breakthrough radar, which benefited from the collaboration of hundreds of different scientists throughout the world. Please welcome the president of the Fondation pour Genève, Marc Pictet. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon for the opening of the second JESDA Summit. As it has been said, we are gathering at a time when geopolitical tensions are severely damaging multilateralism. So, 
what are the implications for our city. As everyone in this room knows, Geneva has, over the years, established itself as one of the main center of global governance with expertise in fields such as peace, security, humanitarian action, health, labor, trade, and of course, environmental protection, just to name a few. Because the, live, the world we live in is changing rapidly, scientific breakthroughs and technological advances are of course occurring at an ever increasing pace. They represent a tremendous opportunity to improve the well-being of billions of people around the world. But they also carry risk of potential misuse. Take artificial intelligence, AI, for example. On the one hand, it is revolutionizing education, as we all know. On the other hand, however, if misuse, AI can tarnish reputation and arm state security through the use of, for instance, deepfake technology. This is where JESTA Foundation comes in. The foundation aims, as we all know here, to anticipate the technological developments over the next 5, 10, 25 years, and to suggest new solutions to meet those challenges with a unique method and instrument to just as radar. The Fondation pour Genève, an entirely private organization, is proud to have supported uh, the foundation since its inception by, uh, two years ago alongside the, the Swiss and Geneva authorities. In my opinion, JESDA is an example of a successful public-private partnership fostering a dynamic and forward-looking international Geneva. I also would like to stress the exceptional work of the 500 scientists and diplomats who contributed to this second edition of the Radar. I also would like to highlight the commitment of the private sector in the Geneva region, which is actively contributing to this ambitious project in many ways. We strongly believe that the JESDA Scientific Breakthrough Radar has the potential to transform international Geneva and shape the future of modern multilateralism. By bringing together the different communities, scientists, diplomats, business leaders, civil society, the public and private sector, JESDA will accelerate the implementation of the SDGs and help to build a more harmonious and secure world. Just that anticipation alongside the unique features of Geneva ecosystem are an ideal combination to build this future. Since 1976, the Fondation pour Genève has been working alongside the Swiss and Geneva authorities to ensure that Geneva continues to play its part in delivering solutions to global challenges. It is clear that science diplomacy has a unique potential. We are all convinced here in this room. But that the general public is largely unaware of. As a result, over the coming weeks, we will be launching a report and a series of public events in Switzerland to explain what science diplomacy is and its potential. Ladies and gentlemen, International Geneva has to pivot. Our future is uncertain on so many fronts. What I would like to say, it is crucial we team up to anticipate and act now. And as uh, the JESDA community puts, put it so nicely, actually here, uh, use the future to build the present. Thank you. Thank you. Let us now focus on the JESDA Science Breakthrough Radar. The fundamental innovation of JESDA is to truly start with the anticipation in science and get a sense of what the future holds in terms of scientific advances. Through a unique mythology, which you can see reflected here all over this room, not on the ceiling, but just about everywhere else, uh, you can see what we will learn and what we will talk about in the next few days. 
Jazza's radar is a new and neutral tool for multilateralism, which gives an overview of possible breakthroughs in science and technology. This tool also helps the diplomatic community and the general public better understand these innovations. As I said earlier, JESDA introduced its first edition of the radar last year. The second edition is launched today. More than 700 scientists contributed to this new edition, representing more than 300 breakthrough predictions at 5, 10, and 25 years for 37 scientific emerging topics. As you can see, a lot has happened since last year, and we will start with a short explanatory video before I welcome our guests to talk more about the radar. I would like to ask uh, my guest to please come up on the stage, so Martin Vetterli, president of the EPFL, Marie-Laure Salle, director of the Geneva Graduate Institute, and Mamou Getty Fakeng, vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town. So, 
So, um, Martin Vetterli, since you're the only man on the stage, we'll, we'll start uh, with you, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the radar and how its creation came about? Well, first let me say I'm very pleased to have a better gender balance than I'm used to <laughs> on the podium. Um, and then uh, maybe briefly to give the history of the uh, science anticipated radar. So two and a half years ago when it was started, we gathered together with Joel Mezzo whom I'm actually supposed to represent here on the panel because his flight from New York was late. Um, so that's a moment of uh, celebrity I can play as the president of ETH Zurich for 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, more seriously, so two and a half years ago with Joel Nezo and a whole team of uh, scientists, uh, we started assembling essentially an expert group on key topics. We had a number of meetings. Uh, we decided to pick things like quantum technology, not very original, it was obvious, uh, geoengineering, uh, which is also obvious, but much more tricky, and uh, <clears throat> the other topics that you have seen here. And this work went into the radar, which I think is a very nice product. Uh, it's an evolving product, so there is still a lot of work, and we have to keep en engaging with the science community. I've also to say that this is not about science, it's about society, which means the real questions are societal questions. These are social sciences and humanities. And <laughs> my dear friend, Amandi, you quoted a computer scientist. I don't know who it is, but he's an <laughs> idiot, right? Uh, <laughs> to say that uh, you don't learn from history, I could quote Hegel, right? The only thing you learn from history is that you don't learn from history. So at least one should know this. Uh, so, but, but my point is really the questions are driven by scientific advances, technological advances. They take a very long time. We discussed quantum this morning. Uh, quantum theory was invented 100 years ago. We see the real effects now, okay? And so to anticipate five years, 10 years, 25 years, it's great. But science, you need the long view, and it's great to have the scientific community engaged, but this under the watch of social sciences and humanities. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about the scientists who participated in this radar? Who, who are they? Because there are more than 700 of them. So it, it was essentially not a self-selected group, because that doesn't sound good, but uh, a network of people um, starting from, you know, scientists at ETH, at DPFL, at University of Geneva and other universities in Switzerland, and then branching out to a number of other academic institutions uh, by posing these questions, which, you know, there is a consensus are fundamental questions in, in science and technology. And so this grew as a network of about 700 people who truly engaged. This was a success in the sense that I think we contacted a couple of thousand and many, many people answered and actually worked quite hard to come up with the result we see now. Thank you. Um, Marie Lorsal, um Science doesn't happen in a vacuum. We know that it is also impacted by broader societal and political uh, problems. It's a, it's a context that exists, which is particularly difficult today, as we know. From your point of view, how can uh, the radar take into consideration these very fast changes in our world? And how can JESDA bring about some min meaningful initiatives? Thank you very much and good afternoon to, to all of you. Thank you for having me on, on this panel. First, I would like to start by um, you know, saying a big congratulations to, to the JSS team and to the many, many scientists. We were wondering how many exactly there were, but between uh, 700 and 800, if I understand correctly, uh, because the, there's been a lot of work done since last year. I would also like to um, actually uh, um, get your, put your attention towards the philosophical and geopolitical lens parts in, in the report, which are, I think, very important and very welcome additions that are making an important step uh, it, that needs to be increased, as uh, Martin just said, uh, an important step towards the, the necessary, very necessary dialogue between all scientists, scientists and all sciences, including um, what we call social sciences. So, let me try to answer your question by, by doing a bit of contextual framing. After all, that's what social scientists are for. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so the contextual framing is actually going back to what motivated this um, anticipation exercise and to actually the big three questions that JSTA put itself and which I really like. Okay, and so what are those three questions? The first one is who are we as humans? And I probably would add who will we be or who do we want to be? Which is a bit more mono normative and you can see the, the difference here. The second question is how do we uh, live together? And here again, we can have a also more normative question behind that. How would we want to live together? Particularly in the context where we know uh, we have an increasing population and very limited resources and a very big destruction of a lot of those resources. So this is the context in which we are going to have to pose that question of how do we live together? And the third question uh, that just that put itself as, as really a motive for, um, for its um, anticipation ex exercises, how do we ensure the survival, the resi resilience and the well-being of future generations? And obviously it's a very important question because if we didn't put in that question, we could probably have very different uh, uh, answers uh, and different approaches to technologies if we didn't bring in the next generation into the picture. And as Martin has said, obviously this, what is very interesting is that those motivating questions, they are fundamentally, deeply philosophical, social science and political questions. Uh, and that, so that's really the starting point, I would say, of just that. So from there, how do we bring together those very philosophical, social science and political questions and the non-social science sciences and technology um, to you know, go over a debate between the way in which we call different sciences. So for me, there are two ways to go. And with the first, and they are not necessarily incompatible or exclusive, they actually should complement each other. And so far, the radar and JESDA has been mostly following the first one. So the first, the first way to go is to take the scientific developments as they are, and by that I include the anticipation on those um, non-social science scientific developments. So this is included on the dynamic path that is being presented in the radar, but to take that relatively for granted and to, in a sense, bring in the social scientist, the philosopher, the politician, or the diplomat uh, to look at this and to make sure that the scientific product stays on the side of the tool and does not veer towards the weapon to use uh, and borrow the title of Brad Smith's uh, last book. Um, so this notion of tool or weapon uh, is not just a very simplistic one, it's really the notion that the tool is the technology as a way in which to reach uh, the good life or the better life, and the weapon is uh, the ways in which technology can derail, as uh, Marc Pictet has, uh, has very nicely uh, also uh, shown. So this is really obviously a, a very important path and we should definitely do that, but we cannot stop there. Uh, there. I, I think this is really a very important point and we cannot stop there for at least two reasons. So this is for next year, huh? <laughs> for, for the following uh, year. And we cannot stop there for at least two reasons, one philosophical and, one, and the other is political. The philosophical one has already been mentioned in fact by Amandeep, and Deep. Uh, um, and the philosophical one is that if we stop here, in fact, what we are doing in the process is we are naturalizing technology. We are turning it into something that is a given outside of our control that we should just be dealing with post hoc, as is in a sense. While, as Amandeep has nicely said, technology is fundamentally a human artifact um, that of all time immemorial in the history of humanity has either facilitated our lives or became uh, a Frankenstein. Um, so the political reason is direct follow-up on uh, from this philosophical reason is that technology ultimately is there to serve humanity and not the other way around. So the political project of who we want to be, how do we want to relate to each other, how do we project our future should frame and drive the technological developments and not the other way around. And so this is where I think we will need uh, soon, if possible, and in parallel to addressing um, the problems in the way we, ha we are doing now, we need to take a different step, a second step, uh, which is to find all possible mechanisms to, in a sense, put the hooks before the cart. 
mettre les bœufs devant la charrue. Uh, and because the oxes are behind the cars. It's I'm nearly done. Yeah. And, and for and you know and for and for that it's you know obviously um, we have to think about many different mechanisms. Transdisciplinarity is one, and we have to to make it happen from the start. And and one of uh, of the mechanisms of that is also a transformation of our education systems. But we're working on this with Marta. Yeah. And I'm sure that we will talk about that in the next couple of days. But Mamouyati Fakeng, um, we've heard heard a different uh, how the importance of science and the importance of science breakthroughs but how can we build bridges between the scientists and the general public on such complex subjects i mean since this morning since we got here one of the things that we had the most is how these advances are going to shape who we are as humans how we relate and how do we how we look after our environment these things, what it means really is that the applications and implications of these scientific advancements are going to affect everybody. And so it is not enough that we sit as scientists, social scientists, humanities, or whoever, just discussing this or even producing the radar. The radar has to go to the people. And so the people on the ground can engage with it. And so we at the University of Cape Town went into a partnership with JASTA to develop the Youth Anticipator Initiative. And the idea is to get the voice of young people into conversation. I mean, the, the radar is a resource. It's a teaching and learning resource, but there are a lot of people in the world who might not get access to it. And we don't want to commit the same errors that we made in the past by excluding some of the voices. And then we hear them only at the picket line when in fact they are dissatisfied about how the advances are affecting them or how they are not getting access to them. So it's important that at this stage, we use the radar as a tool to engage our young people, uh, not only in terms of them receiving. So what we've done uh, this year is to engage young people online um, and, and on the four areas of, um, of, the, of JESDA, calling experts, African experts and experts all over the world, get engaging and taking young people through what is in the radar. Young people being able to ask their questions and, and then to make sure that it's not just a one-way um, uh, traffic, we gave them a challenge. We gave them a challenge at the beginning uh, of the sessions so that they can think about one challenge in their life that they can use the science of the future to solve it. And to show the interest and the keenness of the youth on the African continent, we had more than 100 entries from young people who said, this is the challenge that I'm facing. We didn't give them the challenge. Uh, what we required them to do is to draw on the advances that are discussed in the radar 2021, and that we broke it down for them as in the discussions um, and the discussions online on Sunday afternoon, um, uh, South African Standard Time from four to five, and um, uh, uh, and they submitted their 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 solutions, and we've selected out of those we had a panel and selected three of them who are here today and this week to engage on the discussions and you'll see some of the voices of the young people coming through. So th this is important because if we do not get the voices of young people into the conversation, we increase the inequality, but also the resentment about science, scientists, and how exclusive these discussions um, are and, and who is included and who is not included. And, and I hope is that this kind of work will go on to include other citizens and not just young people. Thank you very much. And I think we will hear the youth on Friday because uh, there is a, quite a big representation here and they will speak to us on Friday. Thank you all very much. I will ask you to return to your seat so we can focus on the next panel. As we have... Um
So we've heard that um, uh, scientific breakthroughs are deeply connected to geopolitical changes, and this can have a profound impact on how science and innovations are developed and whether we can all work together to collectively benefit from them. So for JESDA to be successful, it will have to anticipate where geopolitics as a science is heading. And that is why JESDA has started work on a geopolitical lens for this year's radar edition. And to further strengthen this perspective, we are happy to announce a newly agreed partnership with the Geneva Center for Security Policy and with Professor Jean-Marie Guéhenneau from Columbia University. Professor Guéhenneau will be one of the distinguished participants in our upcoming high-level panel. So we will now focus more on the relationship between scientific advances and the geopolitical landscape and its challenges. Please welcome Ambassador Alexandre Fazel, Swiss Special Representative for Science and Diplomacy in Geneva, who will be moderating the next panel. Good afternoon. We just heard about the radar. That's the anticipation bit, trying to understand what is going to come in terms of science and technology. And we are on our way towards the solutions. How can we understand what the radar says? How can we imagine, correctly imagine, what the impact will be on the humans, on societies, and on the planet? And what kind of solutions can we develop collectively together in order to create a shared sense of purpose? But this work, this transition from the radar to the solution, is not done in a vacuum. It is in a reality we have to face, a geopolitical reality. And to discuss that element, I am uh, very pleased and honored to welcome onto the stage Madame Lidi Akizimana. She is the Chief Executive Officer of AIMS, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, which is organizing every second year the next Einstein Forum. Uh, which is a big event that brings together uh, technologists, scientists, the private sector, civil society, uh, and philanthropists in Africa. <laughs> and then uh, Monsieur Jean-Marie Guénaud, who is Kent Visiting Professor of Conflict Resolution at Columbia University, and of course, whom we knew as the Under Secretary uh, General for Peacekeeping Operations. And finally, <laughs> and finally, again, Professor Amandeep Gill, the United Nations Secretary General Envoy on Technology. <laughs> Monsieur Geno, can, can I start uh, with you? When I mean, we all accept that science is going to change societies, the human societies, and how, how we function. And we need to consider that there are all those geopolitical realities that play into that mechanism. How do you see the interweaving of the science into the geopolitical landscape? Well, as was said before, science is an extraordinary multiplier, accelerator, and disruptor. Uh, and you, look, you take an example like uh, the Internet revolution. Uh, let's do a little bit of history <laughs> uh, for once. Uh, you see that it, has com it is completely changing our societies, frankly. It is both a revolution comparable to the invention of the printing press, in the way it disseminates knowledge, creates knowledge, changes the foundations of legitimacy. And it's also like the Industrial Revolution. It displaces the way power uh, is uh, attributed. It displaces the way money is made. So the impact is formidable. And what do we see? We see that between the rapid advance that it has created and the political institutions, there is a widening gap. 
And frankly, I often think that if uh, Jezda had been created 25 years ago, maybe <laughs> we would be in a better situation now because we would have thought about all the governance issues that we are now having to address a bit too late. And it's much more complicated because we have to deal with giant corporations, we have to deal with massive uh, entrenched interest. It's much more complicated. So I do think, to answer your question, that we need to anticipate, uh, to use a key word of, uh, of Jezda, we need to anticipate so that we, as we see the multiple revolutions that are coming together, the revolution which was mentioned of artificial intelligence, the biogenetic, a variety of revolutions, and each of those revolutions interacts with the other revolutions. If we do not reflect on the impact that they're going to have on societies, if we do not try to think through what kind of institutions uh, will be needed to maintain a measure of accountability, if we do not do that, then we are going to have more and more problems, as we have now with the uh, internet revolution, with the polarization of societies, with the fragmentation uh, of societies. So the time to think through those issues is now. It's not uh, tomorrow. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, how we should, uh, we should address it. And that's why I'm, uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, with Columbia University to, to start this uh, collaboration with, uh, with JESDA and the uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy. Thank you very much. When you say we, we need to anticipate, to build institutions so that we can reflect uh, collectively, this must, of course, be an inclusive uh, exercise. Everybody must participate in it. And uh, if I can turn to you, Madame um, Lidi, if... Uh, and, and so it is important that all um, the countries that come to the table to participate in that debate can do it on, in their own, on their own merits and in their own right, because they possess the science as, as well, which bodes the question of science policy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, the world today is, is a complete mess. I, I hope you all realize that. You know, with the war in Ukraine, the floods everywhere, the hypocrisy in vaccine distribution. The world is a mess. We've forgotten the importance of being human. We've forgotten that we're all the same. If you're not doing well, I cannot do well. We have to work together. And for me, I see three main challenges. The first, it's about building a community, a real community. We cannot do science alone. Science does not, um, it's not only for this part of the world, it's for everybody. And building a community of scientists that is working to address these big challenges that we have on these posters is extremely important. Inclusion is important. What we are trying to do at the AIMS, uh, at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, is really to build that community where young scientists, brilliant minds on the continent, can work together with policymakers, discuss about breakthroughs, technologies and invention, but most importantly, how can they solve problems? How can we solve problems together? The second thing, how do we translate you know, all this research and development that we have into scalable impact? It is about time to have scalable impact, making sure that we are providing solution to real problems. But to provide solution to real problems, you have to work with the people who are facing those problems. Right? You have to work with us. You have to include us in these rooms, in these labs, because we have 
the knowledge. We have this world-class vision also to do better, to be better. And the last part for me, it's really the funding. Funding is important. Funding is so important for us to advance um, uh, science across the globe. And unfortunately, when you look at the continent, you know, we are the youngest population of any continent. Africa is the youngest population. 30% of reserves are, mineral reserves are on the continent. But yet, 1.3% is going into research. 0.1% patent in Africa. This is a joke. This is really a joke. So what can we do? How can we use a platform like Gesta to make sure that institutions like Ames and others in Africa can have access to funding to do more on the continent? We need to stop talking and really going into actions. We've had magnificent plans for the past 20, 50 years. What about execution? What about putting in place and, and, and really implementing all of these great things that we said that we are going to do? It's really important for us to work with GSTA and partner with institutions that are, and foundation and, and multilateral um, institutions who are interested in investing in STEM in Africa because if we don't work together, I don't know how we are going to do this. I really don't know. Professor Amandeep Gill, can I ask you, when you, we hear now those, those challenges, um, uh, and notably the one of inclusion and co-creation, uh, co-development uh, that we all need, surely that is something which the United Nations is focused on uh, as the protector of inclusivity and universality. And what uh, are the answers the United Nations provides through your function and through the common agenda to the issues we have just heard. Right, and I think this one that if I'm not feeling good, you're not feeling good either. This is the Ubuntu philosophy from, from Africa. And at a time of geopolitical uncertainty when so many things are shifting, we need to find those deeper anchors in our shared human values, whether it's Ubuntu, it's uh, the concept of eudaimonia in Greek philosophy, uh, the human flourishing, of Tikkun Olam in the Judaic culture, fixing the world, Heishi in the Chinese culture of harmony, social harmony, or in the Indian culture, the need to preserve that center, that centeredness. Mm -hmm. So we need to dig down deeper at this time. Uh, and inclusiveness is really the, the most important value in this constellation of values. Mm -hmm. And in the UN, uh, we live it uh, by our commitment to that framework, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which by the way, despite so many changes over the past many years, something still, whether it's governments or the private sector or civil society, you know, people put this as uh, one of the guiding frameworks. And the slogan really is, leave no one behind. Uh, and this is regardless of the level of development. So these are goals that are important for each and every country, every, uh, every society on uh, planet Earth. Uh, the common agenda, the Secretary General's report, our common uh, agenda, and then the summit of the future. Uh, so there is an attempt to um, initiate conversations on our global commons, whether these are digital commons or our environmental commons and uh, look to better stewardship of these columns, uh, these commons. Uh, so better stewardship in terms of uh, the guardrails and the common rails, and also in terms of the use of these commons. So if uh, only a few people can use them, then they are not commons, they are clubs. Uh, so how can we be truly uh, inclusive in these uh, areas? On the digital side, uh, a key challenge is connectivity, but there are other types of digital divide 
which we often ignore. I mean, you mentioned that uh, in my previous role, we did some research on digital health, less than 1% of the patents. Uh, um, and e even within that, it was 75% was coming from South Africa. So there is, within the African continent also, a lot of inequity. Mm -hmm. So you need a deeper enabling. Uh, the connectivity alone is not going to cut it. I mean, we have the example of Rwanda. You have high levels of connectivity, but you need to work at a deeper level in terms of data and AI and how these advanced digital technologies are meeting these domains, uh, agriculture, food security, health, education, the green transition, because that's where uh, the economic value lies. And if we don't address it now, we'll have the vaccine uh, type of situation eight, 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Vaccine, uh, uh, the inequity in vaccine distribution really made it clear to most countries around the world that you have to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. So when geopolitics is back, that means geography is back, so where you are matters. And you may be in a situation, in a geography, where there's conflict around you. I and mean, we see that in Europe now, or where you're thinking about, you know, how are my supply chains? You know, I need to bring them closer to my geography. And then there is politics. Today, the vaccine situation, the, these humongous valuations that tech companies have are waking up people everywhere to the power of science and technology. Mm -hmm. and when that comes in, politics comes in, and countries want to run the show, and sometimes these technologies help countries be more selfish. Mm -hmm. uh, you can call it a resurgent nationalism, but at the end of the day, we have a huge challenge in terms of how do we build digital cooperation, mm -hmm. how do we build multilateral cooperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all agreed on our, our ambition of what we want to achieve, and we agree that we need it to do it in an inclusive manner. But, and that corresponds to the usual narrative we used to have around science diplomacy, in the sense that science, by essence, is open and collaborative, and hence inclusive, and is protected from tensions of a geopolitical nature, and uh, goes on even when states uh, and organizations are at odds with one another. But now, we realize lately that the narrative isn't working that well anymore. Uh, and we have a situation where um, projection of power, uh, strategic autonomy, um, geostrategic positioning uses science as a tool as well, which then undermines this logic of inclusion we want to further. How can we break that conundrum? Well, I think, of course, the scientists, they have one shared common ground, which is the search for truth. Mm -hmm. That's very different from the search for power. Uh, and so there is, the, there is an inherent tension, I think, between the, the humility of the scientist who is looking for the truth and the sometimes hubris of the politician who is looking for power. <laughs> That's two different, very different mindsets. So how do we, how do we reconcile the two? I would have two, two answers to your questions. One is institutions. Uh, institutions, they are like uh, the, the lead on a boat that prevents the boat from capsizing. They are the stabilizers of society. They are very important to bring a longer-term perspective. And the other answer I would give is that uh, you need, politicians do not live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the way one shapes the debate, one uh, reveals questions, highlights questions, and, and the word debate is essential. Uh, the way you create a society where it's not a juxtaposition of certainties, but rather a debate about questions. Uh, that is the way to uh, maintain that shared common ground without which there cannot be progress. I think with those two elements of, of the institution and shaping the debate, you are paraphrasing what Jesta is, is, is trying to do, in my sense. Would you have... 
Right, I mean, uh, take the Open Quantum Institute, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think in emerging technology, we need to be anticipatory and proactive and need to build collaboration by design. Uh, before uh, these uh, efforts are locked up in different geographies and become competitive, we need to set the good examples of collaboration. Um, and uh, the Director General is here, CERN is a good example of how people thought about how do we, you know, no single institution, no single country can handle this by themselves. How do we collaborate? How do we pool resources and develop solutions that are for the global public good? So we need to do the same in artificial intelligence. We need a new distributed CERN. Uh, for AI, uh, this will also address the inclusiveness, leaving no one behind mm -hmm. question. And in areas like open qu uh, in quantum computing, where the power impact is likely to be very high. So if you set out a collaborative goal from the beginning, that helps you bend the arc away from competition and beggar thy neighbor type of policies to uh, we are all in it together maybe we can use these technologies to solve our planetary crisis around climate change, hunger, and so on. Thank you. Can I quickly come back to AIMS, your, your organization and this next Einstein initiative you have? Mm -hmm. Is that a possible avenue through which you can feed in your contribution and your demands and requests into a conversation such as the one we are having in Jesta? And uh, so to be an agent of inclusiveness absolutely. through that. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what we've been uh, doing since 2013. Um, the Next Extension Forum, really, it's, it's the platform that brings, you know, scientists, policymakers uh, um, from Africa and around the globe, you know, once every two years to discuss about anything innovation science related to solve human uh, problem at the global level. So we want to have this kind of conversation as often as possible. And we want to include everyone because I, I, there's a scientist that I really love, Carl Sagan, says that every child is a scientist. Every child is a scientist. The problem is, when you start meeting different teachers in your life, they change that perception that you have about science that you have in your heart, right? How many of you here have been traumatized by mathematics? Show of hands. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Why do you think you were traumatized? <laughs> because someone somewhere in your primary school or secondary school told you that, Matt, it's so hard. It's not for you. And they killed that sense of creativity, of curiousness that you had in your heart. We should bring that back at all level. We should bring that back. It is so important. And that's what we're trying to do with the Next Session Forum at a higher level. Thank you very much. And that's what we are trying to do here uh, at, at Jesta uh, as well. I think we have seen in that panel all the challenges we need to factor in when we transition from the radar, from the anticipation, to the solution and crafting the solution together. And that's the st next step we are going to take uh, now. What are those solutions? How have they come about collectively and inclusively? And for that next segment of this afternoon, I would like to invite Michael Muller to come up on the stage. Michael Muller, of course, who is the former Director General of UNOC, the United Nations Office at Geneva, but is also the Chair of the Diplomatic Forum of JESTA. Please, Michael. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, you now heard how we are solidly anchored in science, what is emerging at 5, 10, 25 years through the breakthrough radar, and about the geopolitical context in which we are operating. So the central questions are now, where do we go from here? How can we build something solid which will serve us all, benefit our planet, 
and become tools to allow the world to deal with the most challenging existential issues such as hunger, climate, migration, etc. In short, how can we most effectively contribute to help build the strongest foundations for peace? We started this reflection three years ago, with many of you both in person and online. And when, we, then when COVID hit and we were forced online, the silver lining was that we were able to discuss our work with almost all heads of the UN and other international organizations in Geneva, in New York, and elsewhere. We also interacted and started conversations with an increasing number of ambassadors and other government representatives here in Geneva, in Bern, and around the world to discuss and understand better how our work at JESDA may be relevant to their countries. Science, diplomacy, and action. And the first task was to create the right environment <clears throat> where we could bring all of us together from science, diplomacy, business, and society at large, as we're doing today. And in doing so, JESDA's ambition goes beyond mere reflection, beyond being just a think tank. Our ambition is also to be an impactful do tank. We have the ambition to propose concrete solutions emerging from our accumulated knowledge and work on the anticipated science. And this, uh, this doesn't just happen by putting all of us together as here today. And that is why we conceived of our own methodology, the anticipatory situation room process, which you can see up there described a bit better than, uh, than I will do here. And this is where we start by creating a common understanding of these complex issues and carefully design ideas with dedicated science and diplomacy task forces, and then curate their development with coalitions of partners into sustainable and impactful solutions for the world. And this is what we are very pleased to present here to you for the first time at this, our second summit. The progress we have achieved, especially since our last summit, what we have done and where we're heading. So in addition to receiving the exciting second iteration of our science breakthrough radar, you will tomorrow more in depth, you will tomorrow hear more in depth about a number of these developments with a particular focus on the two most advanced solutions which were outlined by our president a little earlier today. And with this, I wish us all a deeply interesting, useful and impactful summit over the next three days. Thank you. We don't start with the problem. Because where would we begin? The issues of today are very different to our obstacles of tomorrow. That's why we start with world-changing science. We ask scientists how it will impact people, society, and the planet. Then we work together to understand the opportunity and risk. We don't start with the problem. We anticipate future scientific advances in the early stages of their development. First, our scientific breakthrough radar identifies five key scientific platforms. We dive into these with more than a thousand scientists across the globe. Each issue is broken down into four emerging topics. That split into further subfields. From each of these, we pinpoint emerging research. And map major science advances. Five, 10, and 25 years into the future. Take quantum computing. The scientists we work with today anticipate that in five years' time, new and useful quantum algorithms will accelerate future hardware development. In 10 years' time, quantum processors will find real-world applications. And in 25 years, million qubit computers solve useful, classically intractable problems. But why should we care? What does this mean to us? Our planet. We keep asking three fundamental questions. Who are we as humans? How can we all live together? And how can we ensure the well-being of humankind and the sustainable future of our planet? And then? Then we accelerate new ideas together that can last and will make a difference. We bring together diplomats, decision makers, business leaders, and citizens of the world 
in task forces. Jointly design inclusive solutions. The benefit of humanity. Working towards a sustainable future where everyone has the right freely to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. We test. We verify. We prototype. We pilot. We fund. Science and diplomacy working together. From our initial 216 breakthroughs, eight ideas of solutions so far are worked out by our task forces. This year, we are ready to launch a survey on the first two of them to accumulate the support needed for maximum global reach. An open quantum institute in a related global context with our partner XPRIZE to accelerate use cases SDGs. A first global curriculum for science diplomacy and a related youth and anticipation initiative with the University of Cape Town. And then we translate these ideas into action and fund them through our impact forum. Thanks to partners allowing us to leverage resources and create actionable solutions. We don't start with the problem. We use the future to build the present. Thank you. So I've been at Jazda from the very early beginnings, uh, end of 2019, uh, working along Michael's side to um, figure out how do we get from the breakthrough radar to solutions for humanity? Um, how are we going to actually make the impact we're trying to do? So in the next few minutes, I will be discussing with my esteemed colleagues here very shortly, give you an overview of what we've actually been doing for the last two years, literally under the radar. But first, what we mean by solution? Solutions to what? Solutions to open up science to be available and accessible to all. And what we see that science diplomacy solutions are not technological. They're actually about making sure emerging technologies have the best chances to reach their maximum potential while caring for planet and society. And that is with all of us, all of our four communities, the academic community, the diplomatic community, the citizens, and the impact community. So that all of you, all of them, actually participate in the design, but also the implementation of these ideas and these solutions. Now, we don't just think we have the best solutions, so we start with a pipeline of solution ideas that we then have are curated by task forces, like you've heard, and these task forces are co-chaired by a diplomacy and an academic leader every time. They co-design that, and then we actually uh, curate as an honest broker, just that brings all the relevant parties together to actually make sure we propose something that makes sense. And then we evaluate it. It's very important to evaluate to make sure we will have the impact and the value we wish to have. But let's dive into, quickly, the reality of where we're today, onto the, to the two solutions that we've been discussing that have the most advanced through our pipeline in the last 18 months. And with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Matthias Troyer, who is Corporate Vice President at Microsoft and Technical Fellow, and uh, Marga Gualsorler, who's a, an academic expert in science diplomacy, and um, ex-Prize CEO Anusha Ansari. So, Matthias and Marga, you've been with us for two years. You are actually a dot on the radar. Mm -hmm. And what made you, as academic, feel that JESDA was a place that needed to be, a, where you needed to bring your topics to the conversation of diplomacy? Where were the gaps that you identified that were actually needed to be able to have an impact on the world? Matthias. Yeah, thank you. You, 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 Nedaya and Chester, the, 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 for, for this year, the, 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 the summit here, which you need really to accelerate progress. And there are many areas where diplomatic help is needed, but there's one in particular that is crucial for us to get it right. So I've worked on quantum for 20 years and with Chester for three years. And based on that, we want to start the conversation around open access to quantum technology. Why is it important now? This is important now because we are at an, at, at an 
the inflection point in the industry, a point where hype gives rise to clarity. Clarity on what we can achieve with quantum. Clarity on what is needed to achieve it. And clarity what can be done if access is open. And, and one thing is sure, the promise of quantum is real. And with quantum, we will be able to solve some of the most important problems that face the planet. <laughs> Many of them are related to the SDGs. But what is also clear is quantum is a hard technology. And to do that, we will need the, 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 the collective genius of the planet. We need all people to combine. And so for that now, we need to find ways of partnering globally, of finding ways to reaping the, 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 the full benefits of quantum in ways that are safe, equitable, and impactful. So and that's what we want to, to achieve here in the coming days. Thank you, Thank Matthias. You. Great. Marga. So we all seem to agree, and we've heard this morning, that we need to build bridges and foster a common mindset between science and diplomacy communities. So it has almost become a mantra, right? But the, the key question is how. How do we get there? And so we think, and I've, I've been involved in science diplomacy training and education and research for almost 10 years, and, and I think the, the, the key or one of the key ingredients is to start with the way we train the next generation of leaders, right? Um, so nobody really has all the elements and the components and the ingredients to foster this common mindset between science and diplomacy. So the solution really tries to bring together and coalesce the set of actors from the diplomatic, the business, the, the, the scientific, academic communities to bring those ingredients in, the, in terms of competences, knowledge, skills, networks. What do we need from each side to bring together, to come to the interface and be able to understand each other and, and work together to, to address those challenges? So when I was invited by Jesda to, to uh, lead with my co-chair, Martin Chungong, uh, Secretary General of the IPU, this, uh, this solution, I really saw an opportunity a unique opportunity to translate all of these uh, 37 scientific topics that you see in the RADA into a training and pedagogical tool and leverage the, in the ecosystem of International Geneva that has all already all of the institutions that are necessary to achieve this global reach, both diplomatic and scientific. So I look forward tomorrow to discussing and, and sharing more. Thank you, Marga. Now, Anushe, you, um, you were called upon uh, early 2021 to come as diplomacy co-chair on the quantum solutions. As CEO of XPRIZE, you had other things on your agenda. Uh, why, why is this worth your time? What drove you to come and help us do this exercise? Well, I really love Swiss chocolate and I wanted to come <laughs> to Geneva. <laughs> no, but um, so actually my work at XPRIZE is, uh, is a driver of that. And also as a tech entrepreneur, I came to understand the power of technology and I saw how AI developed over the years and how it helped a lot, but also it created a lot of issues and gaps. And uh, as I saw the power of quantum technologies, I saw that that type of gap can exist even in a much bigger way in the world and create more inequities. And uh, I saw this opportunity to join forces and work with JESDA and support it a way to change that uh, paradigm and, and create a more inclusive, as Matteo said, uh, inclusive and safe way where quantum technology, instead of just benefiting a few corporations or a few nations, can become a tool to really bring equity to the rest of the world and, and create a way for us to come up with solutions faster, a way for us to collaborate and understand how collaborative advancement of technology can really benefit everyone, not just as an individuals, but you know, it can bring benefits to corporation, it can bring benefits to governments, but it can also benefit humanity as a whole. Thank you. So Marga, with your co-chair, Martin Chungong, Secretary General of the IPU, unfortunately, who couldn't be with us today. Uh, you've worked for the last 18 months 
with a task force designing and developing uh, a very specific idea today. The same Matthias and, and Anouche, co-chairs of the Quantum Solution, with a quite a large group as well. Now, just in a very nutshell, we have one minute left. <laughs> uh, tell us each, give us an idea, give our friends here an idea of what this is, because we'll have plenty more time tomorrow. Go ahead, Anusha, yeah. Um, so our solution was the Open Quantum Institute. Uh, at the heart of the Open Quantum Institute is collaboration and bringing the talent of the world together and giving them access to technologies that they may not otherwise have access to. Surround them by brilliant minds from scientists from all over the world and give them the tools needed to use these technologies to do good in the world, to solve some of our biggest challenges, the uh, SDG type challenges that are critical for us to solve. So um, this has been at the heart of the solution and we're so excited to get going on it. Mm -hmm. Margareta, in a nutshell, your elevator pitch. Solution in one minute. In, so we Very brought simple. together first a coalition of uh, 14 Geneva, Swiss and international institutions, all of them represented here today. Uh, each of them holding already a piece of diplomatic training, scientific training, and we bring them together to create what we call a framework curriculum. So it's not that we're going to hand a syllabus saying, here's everything you need to know about science diplomacy. It's about what do you need to know if you are a scientist at a level uh, undergrad, or if you are a senior diplomat in a particular country kind of region, what do you need to know to be able to navigate this interface? So it really is a framework curriculum with all the ingredients. And we, we want to work at three levels. The, the knowledge, most of it already is uh, being synthesized by the radar. Then the skills, the tools, the competencies, for example, computational diplomacy, new, uh, uh, new ways to conduct diplomacy. And then the networks, platforms, and, and places to exchange where these communities can find each other and develop this common mindset. So we've had a few pilots already, very exciting, what we call demonstrators. So for example, in May, uh, we organized a science diplomacy week for the first time in Geneva, bringing together um, uh, people from around the world for an immersion experience in the science and diplomacy ecosystem of international Geneva, but also an open forum to really bring these topics to, uh, to, the, to the community in international Geneva. The Youth Anticipation Initiative, as already mentioned by Professor Pakeng, so I'm not going to go into it. And then other pilots and, uh, and, and experiences that uh, will help us guide and validate where are these gaps and what is not already existing, we'll create it. Exactly. So hold your horses. We'll hear a lot more about these tomorrow. We have two full sessions on that. Website, all that's out. But um, the next phase is for these two solutions. We're actually going to finish this evaluation. We're going to launch a global survey in a couple of weeks to all of you. Pay attention to those emails. We're going to be harassing you. And actually, it's very important for us to see what might we have forgotten. What did we miss? Who did we miss? But also, is this the right path for us? And so we're going through this process to make sure that in the end, when we go into the implementation phase, we actually have checked our, all our boxes and that we can hopefully in two years, in 2025, have a ribbon-cutting ceremony moment with all of you. But we actually have six other solutions in our, in our pipeline of solution ideas, who uh, I, I see a number of the people we work with, so the co-chairs uh, around neurotechnology, global digital models, decarbonization, advanced AI, and even an arbitration court for science. Uh, if you could raise your hands, all of you who've been working on this stuff with us in the last, uh, and, and don't be shy because I see you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, come on, I know they're members, including our ambassadors. <laughs> but we've actually, uh, thank you very much for, for all this work. Um, but there are many, many more points, dots on the radar that actually need urgent attention as well. And we should be brokering this conversation with every new emerging technology coming out. So we need to do that with you, with all of you, all our communities. And um, so together, let's continue. You've heard this enough, but let's continue to use the future to build the present. Thank you.
this session is coming to a close, but uh, before you all leave, uh, Jezda is very pleased to be headquartered in the international and irreplaceable city of Geneva. Campus Biotech and the city of Geneva are home to Jezda, and we are very honored to have the mayor of this beautiful city who will close this opening session. Please welcome Marie Barbet Chapuis, mayor of Geneva. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today in this uh, magnificent bio biotech campus more than a century after Geneva became a center of multilateral diplomacy. For three days, this summit will be a place of exchange and reflection on the scientific trends that could be endorsed at diplomatic level to help solve the global problems that humanity is or will be facing. During these three days, you will be anticipating, you will be reflecting, you will be discussing on the future of multilateralism and how science can help this. Geneva, as you know, began this extraordinary voyage to become this respected center of diplomacy more than 100 years ago. Did the pioneers of what we now call International Geneva imagine? Did they anticipate? the fact that Geneva would become this unique and dynamic ecosystem in which the future of our world is discussed on a daily basis? Perhaps. But one thing is certain. International Geneva is a magnificent heritage that we, as host authorities, must keep alive. We must even strengthen the ecosystem so that Geneva remains this essential center of multilateralism. We must maintain the quality of life and the attractiveness of our city so that this type of summit can take place and people like yourselves can come together to share ideas. As mayor of Geneva, I can assure you that it is a real source of pride to host and support an organization like GESTA. It must be said that in terms of scientific innovation, Geneva, and I would even say the role of the so-called Arc Lemanique, is fertile soil. In this relatively small garden, we have entities such as CERN, EPFL, companies and international organizations active in research and innovation, which make this ecosystem extremely dynamic. Geneva is the perfect host for an organization such as GESTA. To all of you, I wish you a fruitful exchanges during this summit. I look forward to hearing the highlights of your discussion and to learn about the scientific innovations that may impact our lives in the next 5, 10, or 25 years. Thank you for your attention, and I wish each and every one of you a brilliant and enjoyable conference. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. We're running a little bit late, but I do have a couple of things to tell you about the program today. After a very, very short break, uh, the first slot of three parallel sessions will take place. In this auditorium, there will be a session called Reshaping Realities with Augmented and Virtual Realities. At the end of the second slot of sessions, there will be a networking cocktail at the forum of Campus Biotech. That's important information, starting at 6 p.m. And don't forget also the public session tonight at the Graduate Institute on an interesting and promising topic, synthetic biology. So this ends our opening session. We will take a very short break, but there will be a longer one at 4.15. A big thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your attention. And have a terrific summit.